<laughs> yes, yeah, speaking of reproduction. <laughs> so, uh, reproduce, develop, and age, these are definitely characteristics of, of life. Uh, we want to be able to pass on our genetic material. We also want to be able to differentiate. Uh, and what that means is we are going to go from unspecialized to specialized. So from unspecialized to specialized. And what that means is we're going to take cells that have no particular function, maybe it's a muscle stem cell, or we just call it a stem cell, and it gets differentiated into myocyte that actually can begin to contract. So we go from undifferentiated to differentiated, special, unspecialized to specialized. Sorry, I'm just trying to stay organized. Is that a No, it's a Roman numeral number two. Okay, I'll try to improve my name. All right, now we also need to be able to grow. And there are two ways in which biological entities can grow. They can grow in size. And when we refer this to cells, if a cell gets bigger, we call that hypertrophy. Or to put it sort of in easy speaking vernacular, hypertrophy. So hypertrophy. Or we can grow by increasing the number of cells, so increase in number, and this is going to be hyperplasia, hyperplasia. We can define an organism as being an organism that is alive if that organism can exhibit adaptability. And adaptability is this response to environmental pressures where we actually change with time to better accommodate or better react to those stresses. And we can actually adapt in animal populations in two different ways. We can adapt within the individual. And if we adapt within the individual, we might have a physical or a psychological change in the individual. So adaptability is actually a really popular term in exercise physiology, a specific subset of physiology, where we look at how can we respond to training, the stress of training, how can we increase cardiorespiratory endurance, how can we increase muscle strength and muscle, uh, muscle uh, endurance. So within individuals is going to be those physical or psychological changes after some sort of uh, a training or response to a stimuli. Then we can also look at these adaptability changes within the whole population. And this is basically leaning up towards what we would call uh, an, an evolutionary change. Uh, and so this would be passing on useful information. Now, the really neat thing here is it's not just about genetic information. We ask, actually can also pass on what are, what's called memetic information or memes. Anyone have anyone run into a meme? What kind of like, what? There's this, there's, like, no, right. It's like a social media thing where like you get a picture and you get that. Okay, so a meme, <laughs> and, and that's a sort of a play, and actually a really stupid play, to be perfectly honest. A meme is some sort of cultural norm that gets passed on from generation to generation. So maybe you have always been, you know, um, a family that goes to vacation, I don't know, in the Smokies. And so you have some sort of meme that can be passed on, and your kids and offspring will go on vacation in the Smoky Mountains, or their kids will go on vacation in the Smoky Mountains. Uh, more biological than that, um, food behaviors, what kind of foods you eat, typically if your parents eat really crappy food, like greasy hamburgers every night, you have a tendency to eat greasy hamburgers every night, or how much physical activity you participate in, or what church, what kind of church you go to could be some sort of cultural meaning. So adaptability within an individual, within a population. Life definitely requires adaptability. Okay, so um, 
those all are going to be important characteristics when we define this whole thing that we would call life. I want to go back and revisit one of these concepts in particular, and that's going to be homeostasis. Okay, so homeostasis. Is that a nine? That is a number nine. So homeostasis, again, uh, a concept or a, a requirement for life. Going back and uh, uh, revisiting it, and the reason we're doing that is because homeostasis is a defining concept in physiology. In fact, it is the purpose of the organ systems. It's the purpose of physiology. And as we study this uh, semester, especially the physiology, we're going to be studying how the 11 different organ systems try to maintain homeostasis. Okay, so what is homeostasis? To start out with, we are going to study what are called normal conditions. We're going to study normal conditions. Now, we've got to understand that just like with anatomy, there is some variation that exists. Homeostasis is going to look at these normal conditions and is going to begin to say how are these normal, condition, normal conditions maintained? How do we maintain the normal? So homeostasis is this idea that we are going to maintain the normal condition. And if we deviate from that normal condition, this is going to lead into another subset of physiology called pathophysiology. And that's basically going to be disease. So when we have a failure to maintain it can lead to illness and it also can eventually lead to death or the antithesis of life. So we got a picture here of homeostasis. And, and what you can see is you have a couple different types of tissue. You got tissue from the brain, you got tissue here from the skin. And what we are responding to here is we're actually responding to changes in temperature. Okay, so if I come over here and if I were actually able to get into this thing, I could crank the heat up or I could turn it way down, right? And all of a sudden it might be like 65 degrees in here or 75 or 80 degrees in here, and you're going to have some physiological changes that occur. What is actually happening is this whole system is responding to those changes in temperature, which are being picked up by the blood. The blood's actually going to begin to change in temperature, right? So if I increase temperature out here in the external environment, your blood begins to respond by picking up that heat. Heat increases the temperature of the blood. Your blood, as it warms, ends up in some place, usually in the brain or the spinal cord, which we call an integrating center, or uh, a, in this case, the control center. And it's going to say, oh, it's getting warm in here. I better respond to counteract this. Because if I go too much warmer, I'm going to begin to slip into the pathophysiology that I'm trying to avoid. And so the brain sends out some signals. If it's too hot, then we're going to send signals from the brain through nerves to the skin. And we may say, hey, it's too hot. Let's begin to cool ourselves down. So we increase the size of the vessels, the capillaries near the surface of the skin so we can increase blood flow. So remember, blood has got the heat in it. It's increasing the temperature. It's now increasing temperature out here on the surface of the skin or near the surface of the skin. We're also going to begin to see some of the, the water content of the blood pulled out into sweat glands. Sweat's going to begin to be produced on the surface of the skin. That heat that's now being trans transferred or transported through the layers of skin are going to begin to trans transmit from the blood into the water that's being laid out on the layer of your skin from sweat. The sweat begins to evaporate, pulling the heat away, causing blood temperature to begin to drop. So when it gets too hot in here, we're going to begin to sweat. This causes blood temperature to begin to decrease, and we're going to maintain our homeostasis. 
Okay. When blood temperature decreases, we're going to actually turn off those mechanisms, and we're also going to begin to have small little contractions of the muscle, which you would call shivering, to help try to maintain your body temperature at its elevated state. Okay? So that's the concept of homeostasis, is to maintain a given condition despite what's going on around you in the external environment. I'm going to try to fill in some of the gaps here, give you some more uh, notes here to chew on. So when we look at homeostasis, and there would be a variety of different homeostatic variables. Body temperature is just one. The level of water in the blood is another one. The amount of uh, uh, muscle contractions is another one. Uh, so a variety of different homeostatic variables that we can look at. Each of these is going to have what we call normal condition. Now, the thing that's interesting here about normal condition is it's not just, okay, body temperature is 37 degrees, got to maintain 37 degrees. Rather than just being an individual point, normal condition is a range. Now, how tight or how loose this range is is going to really depend on the uh, the specific homeostatic variable. But let me illustrate this. Uh, this range basically is a variety of different or a number of different acceptable normal conditions. Okay? And we call the range a dynamic equilibrium. A dynamic equilibrium. Okay, what does it actually mean to be a dynamic equilibrium? Well, to start out with, dynamic just simply means that it's going to move through that range. It's not just static. It's not just one point. And it's an equilibrium because it's trying to balance around some set point or some average. Okay, so we're going to have a set point, and you actually already know a wide variety of set points or averages for a variety of homostatic variables. What is normal body temperature? Okay, in centigrade, 37 degrees. What is normal blood pressure? 120 over 80, the new standard is really 110 over 70. Those are set points. Those are the average that we're trying to maintain within our dynamic equilibrium for each of those homeostatic variables. Now, is body temperature always at 37 degrees? It's actually going to fluctuate around 37 degrees, so we have some variation around that mean or average. Um, if you were trying to get you can watch the video online. Or you can just go and Google homeostasis for body temperature. Okay, so let's try to flesh this out just a little bit more, and we'll actually deal with body temperature. So we're going to give an example of body temperature. We'll put in our set point, and we're going to put in our variation. Okay, so... And remember, normal human set point for body temperature in degrees centigrade? Okay, so 37 degrees. That's going to be our set point. And again, this is the average. So 37 degrees on average. If you were to take blood pressure, I'm sorry, uh, body temperature every 24 hours, once every 24 hours, to take the average should be right around 37 degrees if your body's maintaining homeostasis and you are in normal conditions. Now, it's a range. Body temperature on normal should range. Pretty wide range here would be 36 and 38 degrees centigrade. It's probably closer to a half a degree of centigrade, so 36 and a half up to 37 and a half would be your normal range. So what I'm saying is, kind of to draw this out just a little bit, if this is 37 degrees right here, we start taking temperatures, we might see temperatures change like this throughout the day. 
37 degrees is going to be right there in the average, and we're going to be at that range between 38 and 36 degrees. Okay? So what if, in this case of blood pressure, we begin to deviate? So what if we go above 38 degrees? What do we call that? We call that a fever. And if we are below 38, or I'm sorry, uh, 36 degrees, anyone know what that's called? It's not too common around here. A lot more common up where I come from. <clears throat> Hypothermia, which is nothing to mess with. Fever and hypothermia are pathophysiology, and they come with a new set of rules for physiology. No longer are they normal. Now, what you're looking at here in this figure, if you sort of trace these around here, they're loops, right? They look like a loop. Homeostasis is going to be maintained and modeled by a feedback loop. Okay, so maintained and modeled by feedback loops. Whenever I say model, remember that what are we doing here? We are studying a very complex system, and we're trying to reduce it into terms that we can understand. So something like a feedback loop, it's not really the way that it happens. It's not like the brain's like, okay, got to initiate the body temperature feedback loop. It's just the way that it actually works out, and this is the way that humans are saying, this is how we can understand what's going on here. The cell cycle. Hopefully you've been exposed to the cell cycle. It's a pretty complex cycle. We model it as a cycle. That's the reason it's called a cell cycle, not because the cells are like, yep, it's got to go through G1, S phase, G2, M phase. The cell is just doing what it's doing, and we're modeling it in a cycle because that's really easy for humans to understand. <laughs> So feedback loops is just simply the way that we model it. And when we begin to look at the data under this lens, what we begin to see is there are mechanisms at play that help us to manage each of our dynamic equilibrium, whether it's for body temperature, blood pressure, water status of the blood. They all are going to have some sort of mechanism that we call a feedback loop to manage that equilibrium, okay? Now, there really are two flavors of feedback loops. Anyone happen to know what they are? Someone want to impress me? No. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we have negative feedback, and we have positive feedback. That's not supposed to be feedback. Feedback. So what does a negative feedback loop actually look like? Okay, so there you can see our loops. Uh, you can see a couple different tissues again, brain tissue and kidney tissue. And really what we are looking at here is we're looking at homeostasis for water level in the blood. Now, a negative feedback loop is negative because it is going to counteract the environmental change. All right, so a lot of you have got a bottle of water or some other fluid that you are consuming tonight. If you were to down that whole bottle, put it into your intestines, about 15 minutes later, it's going to enter into your bloodstream, and blood pressure is going to begin to go up because you just loaded your blood volume. And that's not really a great thing, right? You want to get rid of what you don't need so that you don't have really high level of blood pressure. So when water levels rise above their normal range, we have to counteract that and begin to bring water levels back down. And the way that this happens, not specifically for uh, this example per se, but the general sort of model of feedback loops 
is we're going to need a receptor to respond or to actually pick up the change, to identify and, and view the change. So we are going to have receptors. And receptors are going to be anatomic elements. And they are going to be solely responsible to sense some sort of change in, change in the homeostatic variables. Okay, so in this case, you can see that in the hypothalamus, we begin to detect low solute concentrations. So we put a bunch of water inside of our blood, and we begin to reduce, by increasing volume, reduce the solutes that are present, the concentration of the solutes. You take a cup of water, right? You put it down, put some salt in there. I'm like, here, drink this. It's going to be pretty salty. And then I come over and I take a big pitcher of water and I pour all that water in there. It's not as salty. That's what's just happening in your bloodstream. It's being picked up by the hypothalamus in the brain. It's also being picked up by chemo uh, receptors in the aortic arch um, it, within the carotid bodies. We're picking up those chemical changes. Uh, we're also looking at baroreceptor activity. These are picking up the pressure changes. So you have a variety of different receptors that are picking up on that change. We just had a lot of water just enter in our bloodstream, and we got to counteract this. So from here, from those receptors, we have to get to a point where all of that information that's coming in from a variety of different tissues can actually be integrated and processed. Right, I can give you a sheet of paper here, and it may have all of my notes on there, and if you don't process it, it's just simply letters. The information, you actually have to look at it, evaluate it, and determine what it means. This is going to happen in the integrating center. And there's a couple different places where we have integrating center. For the most part, you should be thinking central nervous system with this. So we sense the change. This is just simply data input. You now have a signal going to your integrating center that is coded to say, we have an increase in blood volume. In the integrating center, this is going to be our data processing location. The data is going to be processed and we are going to make some sort of decision. That decision is going to be outputted as an action. So the central nervous system primarily is going to act as our data processing action center. Now, it's not good enough to stop here. We've identified that there's a change in blood volume because of an increase in water, and we've actually prepared some sort of response. Now we actually have to undertake that response. That response is going to be undertaken by a group of tissues called effectors. So this is another anatomic element. Another anatomic element that is actually going to do, if you will, the corrective action. Or corrective action. I can put in a little essay. Because it might not just simply be one thing. So in this case, just sticking with the hypothalamus, hypothalamus says, hey, we have an increase in blood volume. Signal goes to the integrating center. It actually comes back on the hypothalamus, causes the hypothalamus to send out a signal to the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland releases a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. And in all reality, what's happening there, ADH or vasopressin, arginine vasopressin, all the same uh, molecule being produced in the hypothalamus, axonally transported down an axon into the posterior pituitary, released into the bloodstream, enters the bloodstream, circulates everywhere, and it's actually going to target the tissues. I'm sorry, the kidney, the, the kidney tissue. Once it gets into the kidney, it causes aquaphorins to be inserted into the collecting duct, which leads basically to the bladder. Uh, by a very long route, but suffice it to say that by putting aquaphorins with transport water, you're going to begin to strip water out of the bloodstream into the collecting ducts to collect it in the urine, and then pretty soon you're going to get that signal that bladder's full. 
Yeah. Your batter's full. <laughs> Everybody have this? Okay. So that's a negative feedback loop. What was the other one? Positive feedback loop. Now, a positive feedback loop, we are actually going to, rather than counteract, we are going to amplify some change. So there is some sort of change that is detected, and the response ends up that causing that change to be even larger. So the example you're looking at here is the process that occurs during parturition or during the birthing process. So um, you may or you may not know that as we get to about eight or nine months, the baby begins to what they call drop in the uterus. And really what's happening is the head, it, it, hopefully the head, begins to drop into the pelvic bowl, right into the pelvis, and it begins to set right here on this anatomical region of the uterus called the cervix. And as that pressure is induced on the cervix, we have a neurological system or a, a signal that gets sent back into our central nervous system, into our processing, uh, data processing center, and basically says, we have a lot of pressure on our cervix. And what ends up happening here is we have a sequence of events that leads to the production of oxytocin. Oxytocin is another posterior pituitary hormone released into the bloodstream, and it interacts with all of this other tissue around the uterus. Now, remember, what is the signal here? Pressure from the baby's head. Oxytocin interacts with the uterine tissue. It's called the myometrium, and it's going to begin to cause that myometrium to contract. And as it contracts, what's happened to baby's head? You get even more pressure on the cervix. And you get another flood of oxytocin to cause even more pressure. And then you have a variety of other things that are going to begin to happen. Uterus is, st is stimulated to contract. You have uh, the, pl the placenta begin to produce these things called prostaglandins. The prostaglandins are amplifying what oxytocin is doing. And we have the pressure that all that started this whole process, amplifying, more pressure, more pressure, more pressure, more pressure, about 45 minutes to 24 hours or more later, we have a baby that's born, and that pressure is finally released, and we begin to see oxytocin levels drop, we begin to see uterine contraction, stays uh, elevated for a little while because you got to expel the afterbirth and all that kind of stuff, but then it begins to drop as well, we begin to reduce the uh, cervical pressure from the head of the baby. So really, our positive feedback is going to amplify the change and increase the signal. Another example of a positive feedback loop, there's not many in physiology. Most of our feedback loops are negative. But another positive feedback loop, besides parturition, is going to be blood clot. You start out, you get a cut, and you begin to have red blood cells and thrombocytes that adhere to the wound, and the signal gets sent out to cause more vasodilation, so you have more blood flowing past, so you can have more thrombocytes that get uh, put into that cut, and you eventually get that platelet plug that we would call a clot. Okay, so there are two very important concepts here surrounding homeostasis. These are going to be important. You're going to see these come out in a variety of other places as we move through this course and the next course. All right, so when you begin to look at the anatomy items, um, and hopefully you have a um, have had opportunity to begin to look at some of those anatom anatomy terms that you have in your lab book. Uh, what you're going to begin to see is what really looks like a foreign language. It actually is a foreign language. It's Greek and it's Latin. 
And actually, a lot of it is going to be, in modern anatomy, Latin. So our anatomical terms, again, they come from the Greek, and they come from the Latin, and they are going to be roots. Most, not all, are going to follow this. But most of the anatomy terms are going to be from a Greek or a Latin root. Um, one notable exception is a group of anatomical terms like Bowman's capsule or loop of Henley or the Bachman's branch, which are named after deeds. They're named after the guys who discovered the structure and they were so arrogant that they wanted to hang their name to it for the rest of history. These are eponyms. And so an eponym is going to be an anatomical term that has a name of a person attached to it, named after people. Now, most of those things, the Bowman's capsule is actually the glomerular capsule. The loop of Henley is the nephron loop. So we do have names other than the eponym that we are actually going to need to know. Now, sort of a confusing, the only thing that I can really surmise from all of this and all of this legacy is that there were a lot of really like creepy, arrogant anatomists like back in the 16, 17, and 1800s. And they would like fight each other over what, what structures were gonna be named after themselves. But the end result here in 2015 is that there's a ton of confusion, right? So you might go into the literature and you might be really interested in some sort of physiological system and all of a sudden they're talking about a variety of different, oops, I'm sorry. They're talking about a variety of different anatomical structures and one group of people call it the, the Bowman's capsule and the other group of people call it the Glomerula capsule and who's right are they the same structures and there's just a lot of confusion. There were a lot of structures that had two or more names. They were dual names. So two or more names for the same structure. And it would be like taking your car to the mechanic and one mechanic comes out and says, well, you got to change the lug nuts, and the other mechanic comes out and says, you got to change the little screw things on the end of your wheel. And you're like, aren't they the same thing? So lots of confusion, dual names. Fortunately, there is a way out. Okay. So there is our Bowman's capsule in one figure, and down here our glomerular or Bowman's capsule in another figure out of two different textbooks. The way out is that we actually step back and we said, hey, let's standardize this. And so we had standardizations that occurred. And there are two major standardizations. One is nomina anatomica, which I think is a great name. Like if I was in a band, I would want to be like the lead singer of Nomina Anatomica. <laughs> so this is going to be abbreviated the NA, and the standardization here was to only allow Latin names. Okay, so only the Latin names. Now, if you've traveled anywhere in the world, Latin is not a very common language. They used to teach it in high school, but they don't really teach it in high school. I think you take two classes here, Latin one and Latin two. So we're not really interacting with Latin all that much. If you're a Catholic back in the 1950s, you might have gone to Mass and you might have gave Mass in Latin. So it would actually be maybe a little bit beneficial if we used a language that was a little bit more common. And what came out of the standardization was a second set of rules, which is the Terminologia Anatomica. 
the TA. And this was uh, in 1998. This is what we most commonly use today. And it was adapted in 1998. And this is actually a two naming system. We're still going to have two names, but one of them is going to be the Latin. So we're still going to use Latin terms, but we're also going to include the much more common English language. 1998. Now, even with the standardization, there's a lot of pretty complex words. I mean, you look through your physiology textbook, and you're going to run into a variety of pretty long words. Fortunately, you can parse a lot of these words. And if you know a little bit of Latin background, you're actually going to be able to figure out what most of these terms mean. So alongside these standardizations, we also adopted a simplified nomenclature or simplified naming strategy. Okay, uh, This simplified nomenclature that comes out of these standardizations is based off of common elements. And we're going to kind of parse these common elements here in just a second. But before I do that, uh, if you have your book, you might want to turn to the very end of the book. And what you're going to find is there is a lexicon. Uh, it's the last, the last paper page and then like basically the back cover. And there's uh, maybe 200 words in there. And actually, really, they're just parts of words. These are going to be the common elements. You also have a pronunciation guide in the book. And you can use both the lexicon and the pronunciation guide to begin to learn these common elements and begin to speak anatomically. All right, so here is a anatomy physiology work. It is hematology. And what you're looking at here are the common elements. And so these common elements are going to include things like roots. And the root is a stem word that holds some meaning. So if someone has their um, lexicon open, can you look up Hemat? H-E-M-A-T. This is going to be our root. And give us their definition. There's hemo. Not hemo. Hemat's not in there? What's hemo? Hemo is just blood. Yeah, so hemat is actually of and relating to the blood. Then we have this big O right in the middle, and that's called a combining vowel. Now, in all reality, the vowel doesn't really do anything besides make the word easier to pronounce. So instead of hematology, we have hematology. So the combining vowel is just simply going to be a vowel between roots to ease pronunciation. Oh man, that's a tough word to spell, isn't it? <laughs> Dang it. Let's start over. Eases pro -num. There we go. So it eases the pronunciation. Let's 
so in this case, we have the O, but every other letter in the, every other um, uh, vowel, including Y, it can act as a, it does act as a combining vowel. Now, one word of sort of um, enhancement here, so to speak, is whenever we have a very common root in a combining vowel, I'm just going to abbreviate that as the CV, we actually begin to call those combining forms. So gastro is a combining form. It's gast, G-A-S-T-R, and then the combining vowel, O. And you'll see that in words like gastrointestinal, gastroenterology. Okay, So that's going to be a combining form. It's just simply a common root with a common combining form that we see in a variety of different words that we're trying to build. Again, combining vowels, all vowels in the alphabet. are used. However, we will occasionally run into a word that is not parsed with a combining vowel. So a multi-root word may not use a combining vowel. So just be aware of that. And most of the time it's because Adding the combined vowel may not make the pronunciation that much easier. It's better not to have it. Okay, so we have a couple other, couple other combining, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, a couple other uh, elements here, common elements. Suffix is, is on there, but before we get to the suffix, on the other side of the word, we could put in a prefix. So this is going to be some sort of modifying word. And the modifying word that is a prefix, it's a prefix because it's at the beginning. It's at the beginning of the term. Now what it ends up doing is by having this prefix in place at the beginning of the word, it is going to adjust or change the root's meaning. Now, it shouldn't really surprise us too much, right? If we have prefixes at the beginning of words, we're probably going to have suffixes at the end. And what we're going to find, again, is this is going to be a modifying word. It's going to be at the end. And changes or alters the meaning of the root, the root meaning. In the case of the suffix, whenever we have a root and a suffix that come along together, we will call those compound suffix. So that'll be our root plus our suffix that, again, occur together frequently or often occur together. Now, as you begin to look at anatomical terms, use your lexicon, use the lexicon, use the pronunciation key that can be found in the book, and most importantly, be precise. Be precise. So to parse this word a little bit more, the O, this combining vowel, doesn't really add anything. And then L-O-G-Y, logy, simply is going to be the study of. So hematology is the study of the blood.
All right. As we move forward here, I want to begin to introduce you to the tools that you will need to begin to talk in anatomical terms. And we need to start this discussion with the anatomical position. And the anatomical position, you're going to be able to see it right here in these two individuals. There is a very precise and defined way in which we stand in the anatomical position. The anatomical position is going to be defined as your feet flat on the floor and close together. So feet flat on the floor and close together. Typically right around shoulder width apart. Your arms are going to be in a downward position. So your arms are in a downward position. Notice that the palms are facing the observer. We would say that that is going to be palms out. Now, when we have our palms out like this, we uh, refer to this as supinated, or our hand is uh, uh, supinated or undergoing supination. So with palms out, this is an anatomical term called supination, or the hand is supinated. Now, what this actually means when your hand is supinated, and the palm faces forward or faces the viewer. The two bones in the arm, which are the radial and the ulna, they're going to run parallel to each other. So the radial bone and the ulna bone are going to be parallel. So what I mean by that is these two bones in your arm are going to be parallel. What if I rotate my hand so palm is now down? or facing away from you. The bones actually cross. The radial bone crosses in front of the ulna. So if I'm trying to describe anatomical terms, in anatomical terms, all of a sudden, when I rotate to that supinated position and I cross the bones, at the top, the radial bone is going to be lateral, but at the bottom towards the wrist, it's going to be medial. So if I leave them supinated, they now are going to be the uh, ulna will be um, will be lateral, uh, and radial bone will be medial. 